prophecy. Jesus is prophecy. The message of Jesus is prophecy. Ultimate, the ultimate prophetic message is about Jesus. He is living prophecy. He is the living word of God. And so we're going to release the word of God, the testimony of Jesus, and now starts the blessings. Verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Blessed is the one who reads. Okay, first of all, we've got to, um, we've got to see the seals broken. Jesus will break the seals for us. The spirit of wisdom and revelation can be sent from Jesus because the Holy Spirit is a spirit of God sent from Christ to us to help us. We can say, Holy Spirit, come and give me understanding. Show me what Jesus sees when he reads this. Show me what Jesus is really meaning. Holy Spirit, I need your help. I need you. But it says, he who reads. That is not, that the Greek word for read is not to do this. No, no, no. The Greek word for read is to do this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. This word read in the Greek means to loudly speak it forth. To read it out aloud so that, that you can hear it and that those around you can hear it. Because if I just do this for the next hour of my message, I won't benefit you at all. And by the way, our prayers, our declarations is not just for us. Right. Let's get out of me, myself, and I Christianity. Yeah. yeah? Stop doing the me worship time. We are here and we're proclaiming things because as we proclaim and we pray, we can stir up, we can encourage, we can motivate others. And it says here, if you want the blessing, learn how to read the book loudly. Mm. Out loud. Amen. So people can, number two, blessed are the ones who... Hear the reading of this book. So how can you hear it unless someone is reading it out aloud? That makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. And by the way, you believe in your heart, confess with your tongue, you read it out aloud, and you're actually speaking life and revelation and faith into your own spirit. You're speaking death to unbelief. You ought to learn how to speak death to your unbelief. You ought to learn how to speak death to your fear and death to your worry and death to your anxiety. And you can't speak death to those negative things unless you speak. But speak the Word of God. And then you speak life to your faith. You speak life to your hope by speaking it out aloud and then listening with ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Because I could give this message today, unless you've got ears to hear what the Holy Spirit's saying, this will not benefit you one bit. Some people have got ears to let it pass by. <laughs> In and out. You've got to have ears to hear. In other words, you listen intently to what is being said. It says in the book of Romans, chapter 10, it says this. Faith comes by hearing the words of Jesus Christ. And uh, King James says the word of God, the word of Jesus Christ, saying, Jesus is God. But isn't it interesting? How do we get faith? By hearing, and that Greek word for hearing, here and there, is active listening. Because by the way, you can hear what I'm saying today, and it goes in this ear and out that ear. It does not benefit you because it doesn't sit here. We want, it, we want the word of God to go in here, sit here, in our hearts, and here in our mind, and we want it to stay there. You know what I'm saying? And so this is the you got to, you're blessed if you listen intently and allow it to go into you. Number three, the third blessing. Blessed are those who take it to heart. Now this is important. Now this is when after you heard it, then you allow it to sit there. And this is when you can be quiet before the Lord. And you sit there and you allow it to, to just sit in your heart. It means to meditate, literally the Greek word. It means you meditate deeply. You hold it in your heart. You meditate on it. You think about it. You meditate upon it. And then, by the way, then what you do after that is then you learn how to proclaim it out to others. That's why John was told, you know, after you see these things, you need to go out and tell everybody what you saw. Don't just keep it to yourself. Okay. 
By the way, right at the end of the book of Revelation, there is a fourth blessing, and it says those that apply the words of this book. So there's reading out aloud, there is uh, active listening and taking it to heart, meditating upon it, and then applying the words of the book. By the way, uh, most things will not have fruitfulness without application. That's right. Yeah? But I want you to know this. Um, when Jesus reads the scripture, the message, and by the way, um, it's kind of a bit terrifying because the scrolls, when they're broken, the message in that book is dealing with this, the seven, the judgments are going to get released. <laughs> The end time purposes of God are getting released over the earth. It's pretty heavy stuff. And by the way, very offensive to most Christians at the moment because we've got such a, um, an extreme grace, uh, prosperity mindset and we've moved out of the plumb line of the true scriptures and this extreme grace Christianity means that we're going to be offended when God starts to actually move in judgments. Mm. I'll tell you. It's not just the world that's going to be offended. The, the, the Christians will be offended. Mm. So Jesus doesn't look just with one eye. What are we talking about? The, the seven spirits of God, and Jesus' eyes blaze like fire, and when he reads scripture, he looks with seven eyes. What does that mean? <coughs> you see, today, if uh, we look at this whiteboard, and you have red glasses, what do you see? Red. If you've got blue glasses, what do you see? If you've got green glasses, what do you see? And we could all argue black and blue and red and everything, and we're all wrong because it's white. Yeah. A very interesting scripture. Um, it's in the book of Acts about the apostle Paul. And when uh, he was originally a Pharisee called Saul. And Saul the Pharisee thought he was a servant of the Most High God. He believed with great zeal and great passion that he was fighting the battles of the Lord. That he was zealous for the name of the Lord and he was persecuting a movement called the Way, the followers of Jesus Christ. And Saul the Pharisee was going out and throwing them in prison. He was, he was beating them up and when they would put them to death, he put his agreement with them. That's Saul the Pharisee. Okay, But everything he's doing with all of his zeal, all of his passion, he thinks he is serving God and he's protecting the name of the Lord. And he's zealous and he's passionate for his God. So he thinks he's on the right path. That's deception. We can really think that we're right, but we're very wrong. We think that we're fighting for God's purpose, but we're actually defending the devil and opposing the purposes of Christ. See, so Paul was reading scripture with Pharisaic glasses, dead religious glasses. And he, he memorized the whole Old Testament, by the way. He knew the scripture, but he didn't have revelation because he's reading with the wrong glasses. And so Saul, sorry, I keep using the name Paul, but his name becomes Paul later. I'm believing that, that God is going to turn Saul's into Paul's. Amen. Amen. We're going to see a changing and a turning of hearts. Amen. I believe some of the most radical antichrist activists Amen. are believing for their salvation so that they become radical Christ Amen. activists. Amen. Amen. I want to see... I want to see activists for the kingdom of God at the end of the age. Mm. The radical burning ones, you know, passionate, yeah. but that they, they've got a revelation of truth. Mm. Not opposing the truth. And that's what happens. Saul becomes a Paul. He's the most passionate, zealous apostle. He wrote, most of the New Testament was written by him. Yeah. Yet he started off this guy that was blinded by Pharisaic glasses. And so what happens is he gets letters, he gets permission from the high council, the Sanhedrin, the leaders of the Pharisaic movement, the leaders of Israel, they give him permissions to go out to seek out every follower of Jesus Christ, to bind them and put them in chains and put them in prison. He goes with that authority, riding his horse, thinking that he's on a mission for God. And as he rides his horse, suddenly... It says this huge, amazing, bright light breaks out. It's like the sun. It's glorious. And it's totally blinding. And he gets knocked off his horse. And when he gets knocked off his horse, he's blinded by the light. And he hears a voice. And he says, Who are you, Lord? And, and the voice says, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And now he's blind. He can't see anything. And he realizes, oh my goodness, 
Everything I have been doing in my life has been opposing the true purpose of God. I thought I was, I was zealous for my God. Everything I did at Bible college, everything I did in my ministry, everything I did with opposing these heretics that I thought were heretics, but actually they were the truth. And I was the heretic. Everything I've done in my whole entire life, all my passion, all my work, everything I've done has been a lie. And I've been opposing God. He's in darkness. He's blinded. But now he starts to see with other eyes. The eyes of the Spirit start to be opened. He's seeing more clearly spiritually than he ever has before. And he goes through deep repentance before the Lord. Oh, Lord. And the Lord says to him, you need to go to Damascus and I'm going to send somebody there to you. And so Saul is led as a blind man. And he sits by himself in a room, blind, and he's, he's just thinking, Oh my goodness, God, everything I've done in my whole life has been wrong, yet I thought it was right. And then God speaks to Ananias, this no-name disciple of Jesus. Well, we know his name. But he wasn't a great apostle or anything like that in the church. He was just a normal Christian who heard the voice of God. God sends Ananias to, to go to Saul, and, and Ananias has an argument with the Lord. You know, here you're having a, an encounter with Jesus, you know, and Jesus is speaking to you, and I want you to go to Saul, and I want you to tell him what he's going to suffer and what his commission is and everything. And Ananias is having an argument. I can't go there. I know who Saul is. He's like, he's throwing people in prison. He's beating up on people. He's killing my brothers, you know, apart from the fact I don't even want to see the guy saved because I don't like him, you know, because he's killing my friends, you know. And, uh, and then Ananias has an argument with Jesus, and then and, and Jesus wins. It's good when Jesus wins our arguments. Amen? Yeah. But he does. It's like, it's like, I don't want to do that. But Jesus says, no, you need to go to him. And Ananias goes. Ananias now prophesies over Saul what Saul's commissioning will be. And then Saul is baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit and then things like scales fall off his eyes. Isn't that awesome? The, the, the wrong glasses that he's always had when he's reading scripture, those things that had twisted everything into becoming a dead religious pharisaic system, now it says the scales fall off his eyes. I'm praying today for scales to fall off your eyes. Amen. Amen. Because we want to look with the seven eyes of Jesus at scripture that we understand what... God is really saying and not have distorted understandings because of the understanding of men or dead religious systems or our own opinion. I pray that scales fall off our eyes and then we get seven new eyes. So in other words, when Jesus reads the scroll, he doesn't read with one or two eyes. He's got all seven. What are they? Now let's look at Isaiah. <coughs> Book of Isaiah, chapter 11. When you study the book of Revelation, I'll give you a key understanding. The book of Revelation is a very easy book to understand if you have studied the rest of the Bible. Almost all of the book of Revelation is already spoken throughout the rest of Scripture. The problem is we don't understand the signs and the symbols, and so the book of Revelation becomes very confusing to us. It's like a, it's like a closed book. It's sealed up. It's closed to us, but we need to pray for the Holy Spirit to come to give us understanding, but also study the rest of the Scripture, and the Holy Spirit will show you things. So remember, Revelation chapter 5 talks about the line of the tribe of Judah, the branch of David. The branch of Jesse has come. Okay, so here we've got now chapter 11. It says a shoot, verse 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. So here we have the branch of David or the branch of Jesse. It's directly now talking about it here. See, there's, there's key understandings in the book of Revelation that will point you back to the prophetic uh, revelation in the rest of Scripture. So we're looking here now. Okay, okay. The, the line of the tribe of Judah, who is this, the shoot or the branch of David, here it is. He's going to have the spirit of David. He's going to be, a, he's going to be the Messiah, Davidic. But then it goes on, it says this. When the Messiah comes, the branch of David, it says, verse 2, 
The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of wisdom will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom. The Spirit of understanding will rest on him. The Spirit of understanding. The Spirit of counsel. Spirit of counsel. Okay? Then the Spirit of power and might. Spirit of power and might. Then there's the Spirit of knowledge will rest on him. And that word for knowledge in the Hebrew is revelation knowledge. Knowledge according to the knowledge of God. And then finally, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. It says, this is the sevenfold Spirit of God. These are the seven eyes of Jesus. These are the seven paradigms through which Jesus will read Scripture and then understand the fullness of God's purposes. You need to have these seven eyes. You need to pray for the Holy Spirit because he, the Holy Spirit is the one that gives Jesus the revelation. He, the Holy Spirit is the seven eyes of Jesus. Okay, These are the, the seven-fold uh, revelation of the Holy Spirit. So you, you cry for the Lord. Lord, give me the Spirit of the Lord. Lord, give me the spirit of wisdom. Lord, give me the spirit of understanding. Lord, give me the spirit of power and might. Lord, give me the spirit of counsel. Give me the spirit of revelation knowledge. Give me the spirit of the fear of the Lord as I read your word. Let all of the spirit of God come and teach me. Amen. So it's not just you. How do you get the eyes? You've got to actually ask for the Holy Spirit to come and anoint you and help you. Because the sevenfold spirit of God are sevenfold anointings. Mm. Anointings, empowerments. So let's look at the first one, the Spirit of the Lord. When Jesus opens the scroll and looks at what God's end time purposes are, and then as he reads it, he starts to proclaim it. And as it's proclaimed, the message is released. Now God's end time purposes in the book of Revelation start to become realities. Okay, the Spirit of the Lord, this is it. The word in the Hebrew is dealing with Yahweh. Or it's dealing with Jehovah, depending on how you want to translate that. that. That Yahweh, God is God. This is the first thing you need to understand. If you want to read and interpret Scripture correctly, you are not God. You are not Lord. You are not King. It is not about you. That's right. It's not about me sitting on the throne. Mm. He is Lord. Mm -hmm. He is God. Mm -hmm. He is Sovereign. And so it's not about what your opinion is of what is right and wrong. Right. God doesn't care what your opinion is. Right. God has an opinion. Mm -hmm. You see, unless we come to this place of understanding the fullness, He is Lord, mm -hmm. He is God, mm -hmm. and I am a man, as, as it says in the book of Psalms, let God be true and every man a liar. May every one of your opinions that opposes the opinions of God, may you acknowledge that they are lies. My opinion is lying to me. Why? Because my opinion is opposed to the opinion of God. Right. See, only when you understand that God is God and God fully becomes your master, your Lord, your King in every way, then can you start to really understand Scripture. Right. But as long as I am King, I am Lord, mm -hmm. it's all about me. Mm -hmm. I want you to fulfill my vision, Lord. I want you to, to give me my dream and make it a fulfilled thing. And I want you to give me my desires and... And please give me, give me, Lord. As soon as you've got that thinking, it's going to distort how you read the Word of God. That's right. The reason why many people, um, in fact, they are. If, if you preach on end times, you preach on the book of Revelation, and there's people that get offended when you teach this. And I'm talking about the church. You start defending traditional marriage against same-sex marriage. Mm. I've had Christians get up in churches and start yelling at me, saying I'm full of hate because I'm defending what, Bible, what God's definition of marriage is. God's definition. Same-sex marriage is Satan's definition of marriage. How could I ever agree with that? But you see, when, we've got our, when, we, when we're looking at men as Lord and the opinions of men as being important, then we can stumble. We've got to start to understand that God has opinions that will be very offensive to you. Are you ready? Do you really want to hear the voice of God? Because God is going to ask you to do things in your life that you don't want to do. Mm. See, until we have that mindset of the Lordship, we, we are not going to, not just through Scripture, but when the Spirit of God prophetically comes to us and He starts to speak to our spirit, we are going to reject it. We're going to say, here is the Lord. And we say, get behind me, Satan. 
That's the devil. It must be the devil because it doesn't make me feel good. Mm. Some people think when God speaks, where their heart just instantly gets full of peace and joy and happiness. I'll tell you what, when God speaks, there'll be a shaking in, in your inner man. Mm. And all that is sin, all that is self, all that is ungodly, it is going to rise up in anger and oppose what God is saying. There will be a war in your heart. Mm. By the way, if you listen, the truth will set you free. Yes, the truth will give you true joy and true peace and, and true healing. That's God's intention. But to heal us, He must speak the truth, and the truth will hurt like hell till it sets us free. Yeah. Do you understand this? Yeah. Because this is the problem. is We're all thinking about what makes me comfortable and what I like in life and what I want to do with my life mm-hmm. and say, okay, God, can you please make me more comfortable and can you give me all the things that I want? Um, that is, you're never going to have true biblical revelation understanding. You're not going to really clearly hear the voice of God because you've got those wrong glasses on, mm-hmm. those wrong filters. Uh, I, I shared about the idols of the heart a few Sundays ago and how when, when we speak, it's never just um, um, your ears listening to the message and the message going into your mind. It's never like that. Every message, every word you hear from people gets taken through the filter of your heart. And while you've got idols on the altar of your heart or the throne of your heart, as long as there's false gods there, everything gets distorted and you hear it wrong. Mm. And so that's why we'll be calling the devil God and God the devil, you know? Mm. Get behind me, Satan, the Lord's standing there, and then we say, oh, welcome Jesus, and it's the devil. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, for Jesus, for giving me what I want. And the devil's just a wolf in sheep's clothing. Or a demon in Jesus' clothing. Mm-hmm. It says about the Antichrist, by the way, um, not the Antichrist, the false prophet in the book of Revelation. When the false prophet comes, he's going to 